Welcome to the GP Llama YouTube channel and to a closer look at the new Zwift Ride smart frame that will answer a lot of questions that have come through after the announcement of this product last week. And after that, I'll take you through my handlebar upgrade, which took the ride from this to this. Now before getting into all the technical details, a quick overview of what the ride is. Now the ride is a smart frame with a single speed drivetrain and some enhanced Zwift play controllers up the front for virtual shifting. Now initially the ride ships bundled with the Wahoo Kicker Core and comes in around $12.99 US. Now that price is for both the frame and the trainer bundled together and that goes on sale late next week I believe it is. Now the ride itself will be available without the trainer in the near future and that should come in well under the $1,000 US mark. There's a lot more general info about this bike in my previous video, which I'll link to in the video description below. But for now, let's get stuck into the more technical side of things. Okay, kicking off with the top tube width coming in at 35.55 millimeters. And I can report with my narrow stance when I pedal, no thigh rub like I get with other smart bikes. The front foot is a softer plastic right on the bottom there with some texture for grip. It's not rubbery but it's not plasticky either, if that makes sense. Coming in at just over 81 millimeters in length and around 47, 48 millimeters in width. So a lot of surface area there. There's the teardown of that. And it just sits in the end. So I suspect there might be a taller one coming for other trainers when they hit the market. Stability is another thing people are asking about. And the front stability is absolutely rock solid, but the stability on the kicker core all coming from the rear end, which is the trainer itself. So standing here on the pedal and no hands on the bike, nice and stable on the left hand side, right hand side, not as stable. If you were to lean a little further over, the trainer does tip, but one hack to solve that would be to extend that leg right there. Stay tuned for that in another video soon. Kicker climb compatibility is a straight up no. And well, there's why. There's nowhere to mount the thing on the kicker climb. Okay, a close look at the drivetrain and mind blown, the chain does not route through those rear stays. So the chain can be removed without actually breaking the chain. Now the tensioner does get in the way in that position, also gets in the way in that position. So if you put the tensioner down about there, the chain pops straight off, like so. And once the bike is off the trainer, obviously the chain just pops straight out. Bottom bracket spins. Well, once we get the tensioner off that, very, very freely. We'll have a close look at the bearings in just a few moments. Buttery smooth is what I would call that. And done, good stuff. Okay, chain back on. Once I untangled everything, so it's a bit of a challenge. Okay, back on, good to go. And to the answer on the cranks that everybody didn't want to hear, and it's a no. They are custom forged alloy cranks, and that's why. Clearance for the tensioner, and also the spacing around the bottom bracket, so they are custom cranks. Let's have a closer look at the cranks though, using a standard square taper crank set removal tool here and off we go a closer look at the bottom bracket and it is simply two bearings pressed into the frame shell and an oversized square taper and they're using 6004 bearings which are well they spin pretty well to be honest now i'm told they've been tested through to 25,000 kilometers and I guess given it's indoors and quite protected, I expect these will last a little longer than, well, a bottom bracket outdoors, anyhow. My quick rough measurement here of the square taper bottom bracket, it is a little difficult because it is tapered, 15.43 on the calipers there. I believe the official spec is 14.8, so very close. However, well over the 12.6 mil standard for square taper bottom brackets. So crank compatibility, pretty much a no at this point. Okay, a close look at the drive side. Let's pull that off. Pull out the crank bolt, and again with the square taper bottom bracket remover, which reveals something that is standard. That is the chain ring used. So 42 tooth coming in at 104 BCD, and just checking the chain ring bolts here aren't anything too funky. They just screw straight into the metal plate behind there. So you can replace that. However, there's not a lot of room where the chain tensioner is in place. So my idea of putting a larger chain ring on here, maybe up to a 46, I don't think is going to work very well at all. 
So yeah, resigned to the fact that not much can change there in the bottom bracket and crank area, but good to know those standard tools do work. Okay, and those bearings do spin quite well. Oh, and by the way, the bearing in the tensioner is also silky smooth. That's a 6203 bearing on the chain tensioner. There's been a few queries about the seat post and I can confirm it's non-reversible, so it can only be installed one way. It is an aero seat post, but that comes with one major advantage. The saddle is always pointing forward, which can be a problem on some indoor smart bikes. The fore and aft adjustment is only on the rails, standard rails, so you can put whichever saddle you like on here. And the usable fore and aft distance, officially about 35 mil, unofficially you might squeeze a few more mil out of that. Okay, given I've covered quite a bit of ground in the last five minutes, I'll put up this reference here answering all the questions I've just talked about and then some more from other questions that have since come through. So if you want, pause the video, go through the details here, and then we'll get into this handlebar upgrade. Okay, now it's onto the bars and getting these swapped out for something that suits me a little better. So standard 31.8mm clamp and it has these proprietary little clips there for the USB-C chargers. We'll have to get rid of those and do something creative with those charge ports, along with these levers. The new updated play controllers, or the ride controllers, I guess you'd call them. They're a little different and have little rubber plastic hoods on the back side of them. But everything else looks pretty stock standard with the mount being in here. All right, let's get to work on this. First of all, we'll take off this front part here that's a three mil bolt in there okay with a little bit of wiggle that comes off it's absolutely possible to slide the entire front end off and do this upgrade elsewhere but i'd rather do it on the bike in place all right quick untaping removal now this isn't a how-to guide this is just a yes you can kind of guide um and that was not the right way to take things off. This is the best way to remove these bars. The better way of removing it is just to totally undo that bolt and just pull them straight off. Now onto these little clips, we'll remove these. I've got an idea of where I'm gonna put the USB-C chargers for now. I'll talk about that near the end. Okay, bars off, bars on. That's the swap, it's as easy as that. Getting them lined up was probably the most trickiest part. Making sure that flat section was good with my position on the bike, my palms. Okay, get anything torqued down with the torque wrench of experience and life. It's indoors, so I didn't actually use a torque wrench. Recommended to use a torque wrench if you're doing this yourself. Okay, these back on. These go on very, very easily. Like so. And then from there, it's all about just lining things up to your personal preference. So I am a bit finicky with these bars and everything indoors, but that's looking pretty good. There's enough finger gap there between the aero uh, tops and everything right there. That's all good. That's feeling good. Just wiggling them right into place, making sure everything's lined up. And what I'm going to do with these for now is put the USB-C charge ports just along the front there. Not an ideal position for those who sweat like a typhoon, if that's a thing. Um, ideally, and in the future, what I'm going to do is internally route these with a Y splitter and have one single charge port. But I'll get to that in uh, video number three on the bike, I think. I need some ribbon cable to get that done. But for now, those charge ports will go at the bottom here. Again, not a video about my horrendous taping skills. There's a bit of a lip there at the top, so I will be putting bar tape across the top there just to reduce that lip. That goes on pretty well. Okay, smash that in. Cut out the little hole there so I can get to the USB-C charger. But this was a lot easier than what I had thought. And as I mentioned, I'll be repositioning those soon. Okay, charges in and testing. They're still working, happy days. And that flare on the drops and those nice comfy tops. I am super, super happy with this result. Uh, I'll redo everything once I do the internal cable routing. So don't worry too much about the bar tape. I'm sure it's gonna be pretty horrendous soon. All right, everything else back on and it's job done. I have pimped my Zwift ride. But this is only version one of the pink being version two. I'll be looking at putting that Y splitter in and that one single charge port right down there in the bar end. I think that would be super neat. Alrighty, there we are. A closer look at the Zwift ride and what can and can't be upgraded, including that bar upgrade, which I did for about 50 bucks US.
Now I'll put links in the video description below for what to search for for those bars. AliExpress and the affiliate links are an absolute nightmare, so I'll just put a search term that you can go off and knock yourself out with. And as always, if you found this video informative, give it a thumbs up, hit subscribe to be across more videos across this channel, and thanks for watching.